Hey, good morning. You know, I uh, just uh, got to see the video. I was back in the office, got to see the video for the veterans at the very beginning of the service, and um, just realized that we hadn't uh, had a moment of prayer uh, for grat- of gratitude for those that have served, men and women, and uh, those that are serving. And so um, as we enjoy the celebration of worship and the freedom of worship today, um, let's thank the Lord <laughs> for um, not only um, those who kind of govern this country, but those who fight to protect it and have fought to protect it. And um, so we're grateful people, are we not? Let's give the veterans a little bit of love. You want to? <clears throat> hey, veterans, go ahead and stand up. Let me see you. Stand up, veterans. Come on. All the veterans in the room, let's see you. Come on. Yeah. Let's hear it. Thank you. God bless you. All right, you guys can sit down. You've already been in the military service. You deserve a break. So we're going to let you sit down and let's have a word of prayer for you all. Uh, Man, Lord, my heart is full today as I look around at these faces that uh, some of whom I know, they're they're close friends, people that have made the decision somewhere along the way to um, serve at this level. I sometimes wonder, Lord, if um, maybe veterans have an understanding of what it means to follow you more than the rest of us. Because they know what it is to live and fight and die or be inconvenienced for a mission that means something to them. Personally, corporately, they, they know what it is to defend, to fight, and to, and to put their life on the line for something that they believe is bigger than they are. And Lord, we are a grateful people around this room. And we thank you for those that are part of our body who... Um, who did serve, and those who are serving. And I pray, Lord, um, that through not just my prayers, but the prayers of people in this room, people all across this nation today, that you would pour out a special, special dose of your grace and mercy in the lives of these men and women today, that they would feel honored over the next few days here, that they would feel your smile and your pleasure on them, and they would sense the gratitude of a people, uh, the people especially this morning here at Alive. Uh, Lord, as we head now to your scripture, I pray you would hide me in your cross, and that um, when we leave here, um, it wouldn't be, did we like the music, did we like the message, it would be, wow, God is amazing, God is worth living for, God is worth showing up for, God is worth sacrificing for. And wherever God leads, I follow. I follow. Because as Paul mentioned, you truly are the hope for this world. You truly are that hope. And as we watch the news and we think of all the things that are wrong on the planet and all the things we'd all like to fix and we rant on Facebook. and um, Just this morning, just such clarity in my spirit that you and you alone have been, are, and will always be the hope for this sin-sick planet. And so we align ourselves with you. We've gathered to worship you. We've gathered to hear from you in your name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, um, welcome to the Two Ship series that we're looking uh, at together. And basically this series is designed to look at the church. And it's through a unique lens that sometimes people wouldn't think of necessarily for the church. Um, But the unique lens is this. Um, It comes to our attention that there can actually be, you saw it in in the bumper video, that there can actually be two ships on the same water. And, and they're kind of both have crews and, you know, both have captains, very similar makeup, but these two ships have completely different purposes. A cruise ship is designed around relaxation and rest. It has passengers who are relaxing and kind of kicking back and taking it easy, and it has a crew that waits on them kind of hand and foot. 
But then the other ship we've been looking at is the battleship, and, and it has no passengers because everybody who's on a battleship has a role. Everybody uh, belongs to the crew, and everybody on the battleship is helping to fulfill a common purpose. Well, our belief is, just to show you our hand up front, that the local church is truly supposed to be a battleship, and we're supposed to have that kind of uh, mentality as we fulfill a common purpose. And we believe that that local church, church or the, the local church is to be a battleship, and we're looking at our church through that lens over the last few weeks. And we started by looking at our God-given mission. Now, uh, the God-given mission is this. We want to reach spiritually hungry people, and we want to see two things happen in their lives. We want people to begin a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and then we want people to find an active role in Christian community. All the thing that this organization is about is to accomplish those two goals in the lives of people. That's it everything. And so we're constantly trimming the fat, so to speak, as we look around the organization <clears throat> and as the thing grows and we're thinking, does it help us accomplish one of those two goals? And if it doesn't, man, we, we kind of just lop that thing away and say, okay, we're not going to do that. And, and you need to understand something. If you're just visiting today or you've just started coming to the church in the last year or two, you need to understand something about that, that mission statement that I just shared with you. That's not something we looked up in a book. As a congregation, we believe we heard from God, and God told us that that's what we're supposed to be about. And so you need to understand that up front, I just want to be totally honest, if you're investigating a place to land or church to go, whatever, I don't know, but you need to understand that this isn't optional for our church. This is what we do. It's what God called our collective hearts to as a community. That's kind of the first conviction, but here's the second conviction. It's the belief that if any man, woman, child, family, single, divorced, married, big, small, shorter, and different, anybody will commit their lives to those two things, <clears throat> personal relationship with Jesus and an active role in Christian community, the conviction we have is anybody can experience spiritual transformation. We really believe that. If you'll commit to that, if I'll commit to it, then we're going to experience, experience spiritual transformation. Then last week, as that was kind of the mission, then last week we sort of looked at the message and we had a, this is a football moment, if you were here last week. If you weren't, you can look it up. And we looked at our very clear, most fundamental and basic message, and, and it's this. And Jesus is Lord and Savior. Jesus forgives, and we follow Jesus together. So already, if you're just checking out alive, you know DNA stuff about this church. You know what our mission is, what we're trying to accomplish, and you know what the message is that we're trying to accomplish. Today, what I want to go after is what will mark this body. We have our mission, we have the message, but what will be a defining mark of the folks who call this their church home? And um, because there's a way that we do things that sort of sets us apart from other organizations. A, a battleship serves other people. You veterans know all about this. You know what it is to serve people, to seek to protect people, or to care for people, even if these people aren't grateful. <laughs> Some of them. Most of us are. The church is very similar, and let me illustrate it to you this way. Uh, everybody loves to go out to eat. Fair? Come on, let's get your hands up, little church aerobics. How many people love to go out to eat? Great. Okay, so you love to go out to eat. <laughs> now, I've noticed by going out to eat, there are two kinds of people, and they are represented in this room. There are those of you that go out to eat who order what you want to eat. You people are of the Lord because <clears throat> you are what I would call food hoarders. So in other words, when you order at a restaurant, you eat what you ordered. You're only looking at your plate. Do you know why? Because you ordered off the menu what you wanted to eat. You people the Lord smiles upon. And it, let's see the, the food hoarders. Let's see your hands. Come on, no more church aerobics. Say, yes, Tom, that is me. Okay, put your hand on. The rest of you nasty people, let me tell you what you are. You are food sharers. 
And so when you order, you order something different than anyone else around the table because you know in a few moments you're going to be grazing. <laughs> you are going to be grazing. And so you get up with your fork because you think everybody ordered for you. <laughs> Come on, let's see all you food sharers. Get up. Let's see your hands. Okay. This, uh, how many of y'all just lying? You said, I'm not going to say anything because I... Here's, we were out to eat a few months ago with some friends and family was all there and we were eating and, and man, this woman, right as soon as we said grace, they said amen, she was up with her fork and walked around the table with her fork going into people's meal. Oh, I want to try some of that and stick it in a big old pie hole and that was going on all around the table. She came to me and said, I will punch you. Don't touch my plate. I have ordered what I want to eat. I recommend you do the same. It has nothing to do with the message, but man, it feels good to get all that evil out of me right now. It's n terrible. The Bible says you people are gross. I mean, that's just not. Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I want to make a point out of all that, and it doesn't really work in my favor as a food hoarder, but it occurs to me that these two positions kind of describe how people approach church world. <laughs> Um, there are some of us who are trying to hoard what we have, and, and this is my seat, this is my parking spot, this is my preference, this is my style, this is my taste, this is how I want my children to be cared for, blah, 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 blah. And, and there are others who kind of approach church with more of a sharing mentality. Sharing is bad at the dinner table, but it's good in church, amen? Okay, three of us are, okay, so... <clears throat> The reality is, for a live Wesley in church, here's the reality. Listen up, everybody. This is going to impact everybody. To fulfill our mission, it's going to require that we be marked with generosity. This body must be marked with generosity. We must be a sharing church. We'll need to continue to be a generous body of people with our time and our resources who need to have and will need to have these generous hearts. And I can hear what some of you are doing right now. You're doing this number. Pastors see it. We get taught this in seminary. You're like sitting harder on your wallet because you're afraid that that's what I'm going after. I'm not going after your wallet today. You can just relax. Just, just relax. We already took an offering, but we'll, we may take another one. I'm no, we're probably not. I'm not talking about your wallet today. I, I actually want to go deeper, and I actually want to talk about hearts and, and what it will mean for us to be a generous church. I want you to consider talking about this as a family, as a couple, with your friends. What would it mean? Because as we go into the next stage of what a life's being called to, we will have to all move from a passenger mentality to a crew mentality. This ain't no luxury liner for you to sit by and wait for somebody to wait on you hand and foot. You're at the wrong church. That's not this place, because that's not we've, what we feel called to do as a church. Um, this is how the early church approached the new movement of Christianity. Just so you're clear, this isn't Tom's idea. It's actually just trying to go back to basics. This is a Bible kind of conversation. This is from Scripture, so if you don't like what I'm saying, at least argue with the Scripture. This is what they said. They devoted, that, that means is they're constantly diligent they stayed after. There wasn't a day they woke up and didn't think about it. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Now watch this. This is, this is going to make a point at some point. Everyone was filled with awe. Same word that we use for fear, but fear is a bad translation. What that word actually means is reverent or profound respect. You follow? They were filled with awe. We don't awe very much these days, but they were filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers are together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. Doesn't this sound like something totally contrary to our culture? <laughs> selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, friends, what I just shared with you is recognized by scholars, liberal, conservative, the whole route, as the birth of the church. And it started with sharers. It started with people that were marked by their generosity. Scripture said there that everybody was filled with awe. 
You know what I've noticed in church world? <laughs> you know what I've noticed in our church world? <laughs> People begin with this sense of awe. See if this isn't true. This is a great place. God is good. God is teaching me. God is transforming me. My family is changing. The music is great. The pastor is great. The children's ministry is great. But what I've noticed is, over time, often the awe becomes less awe and more awe. True? We kind of think, oh, I don't even like this coffee. Do you all remember we didn't have coffee? Come on. I don't like this parking place. Do you remember we didn't have parking places? The awe becomes awe. You know when I think about this? This is really embarrassing, and I will not share it any other service. <laughs> have you all been to the bathroom here? Don't answer that question because <laughs> it's inappropriate. But if you go to the bathroom, do you know all you have to do is stick your hand under the faucet and the water comes on for you? Yep. Oh, man, <laughs> tell me that's not amazing. Okay, well, anyway, it still is impressive to me. I think about it every time, like, my God, I'm responsible for killing the battery in four of those things because I just, that's just an amazing thing. It's just simple mind, simple pleasure. Well, see, people sort of do this with church. People kind of come in awe, and then they'll eventually get hung up on something. I've seen this happen. It's probably happened in your heart and life. I know what's happened in mine. They'll get hung up on something that didn't go their way or something that was said or people will get accustomed to things being a certain way or people will actually harbor hurt of what was said by somebody. And what will happen is the awe that once characterized their worship and their experience with the church will become awe. And parents, you listen up. When this hits us, it impacts more than just us. And I've seen it play out. And the worship and the experience will fade. And the awe that once characterized their gathering will be lost because some of us have all of a sudden realized that church people are not perfect. And we'll make an issue out of it. And when our sense of awe fades, this is what happens. We begin taking little exits away from the church. And what was once a do not miss now becomes, ah, uh, take it or leave it. True? What was once kind of like, oh, let's make sure we pray for the church, now we forget at family devotions. <laughs> what was once a priority in our giving now is, well, I'll put a couple bucks in to sort of ease my conscience, but it's not a prioritized place in my life. And battleships can't afford to have crew members making little exits. So if you believe the church is a battleship, you understand why Tom's a little intense about it. The mission is just too important. When people lose their sense of awe, they begin pulling back with their resources and their time. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You say, yeah, but Tom, you know, this made me mad or this happened. And, and I know it sounds petty here, but it's not petty. I understand. I do. But the scripture is very clear. I mean, you might have a legitimate gripe as to why you're mad or why you're losing your sense of all. That, that's fair. But the scripture is clear on how we press beyond our disappointments and recapture our sense of awe. So if that's you and you know you've been making these little exits, look what Proverbs says. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. What makes a church on mission, friends, isn't the generosity just of the pastor. It's the generosity of the crew. That's what really makes a church begin to rock and roll. And over a decade ago, as our church began to sense God pulling us to this new level of obedience, we ran all kinds of analysis tools and diagnostic tools to figure out what had kind of caused our church to sort of have this flatline impact. And you know what we discovered? If you've been through our discovery class, you know what we discovered. And it was basically this. It was we discovered that we were great people who had lost our sense of awe, and the proof was in our money. Not the money that was coming into the church, but the way the church was utilizing the money. 
In other words, what we were doing is we were spending all of the money that was coming in on ourselves. And what we had to do as a church, and we did it, was we hit a Control-Alt-Delete, and we changed everything, and the first thing we changed was the budget. And today, if you get a hold of the budget and you look at it, and you guys approve it every year, you will see the top-rated, funded source in our church is the outreach budget. By far, nothing even comes close to it. Why, why did we do that? Well, because we believe Genesis, Proverbs 11 says... Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. The generous will prosper. So generosity refreshes us. You say, Tom, I don't believe that. And that's fine. Just take it up with Scripture because that's what it says. Are you all familiar with the uh, uh, Pareto principle? Pareto principle, however you say it. It's probably because I didn't say it right. That's why you're not familiar. (laughs) I'm not going to try again. That was embarrassing (laughs) enough the first time. It's also called the 80-20 rule. How about that one? You familiar with the 80-20 rule? Yeah, well, that's obviously the Perino principle. So that's what it is. So so here's basically how this goes. Roughly 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. That's what the principle means. And it's actually written by an Italian guy who said that the land in Italy was owned kind of by uh, the 20% of the people. And that was kind of played itself out in organizations. So business gurus have had a field day with this one. Um, And for decades, and and economists have actually enjoyed theorizing over all of this. And the Pareto principle is often applied to organizations, businesses, churches, the whole nine yard. I'll give you some examples. 80% of a company's profits comes from 20% of its customers. Or 80% of a company's complaints comes from family members. No, I'm just kidding. Comes from... (laughs) comes from 20%, this won't be the one online, comes from 20% of its customers. Here's another one. 80% of a company's sales comes from 20% of its product. So, so what does this mean for the church, for our church? Well, here's what it means. If the Pareto principle is in full effect at alive, here's the implications. We have too few people doing too much and too many people doing too little. You see? Finding an active role in community is an all play, and our mission involves everybody. So together we advance. But why do we feel more comfortable being a passenger at Alive? Why is it we're more comfortable kind of sitting in the dark room and cruising and then getting in the parking lot and leaving? Why are we more comfortable being a passenger than a crew member? Why are we more comfortable observing what happens here as opposed to getting involved with what happens here? Now, we're all busy people, I understand that, and yet some will choose to prioritize being apart. Some of you incredibly busy people, I'm so impressed by this, but you choose to be a crew member at the church while others don't. So why is that? Well, i got a couple of reasons. Here's one. For some, I would say you are choosing a passenger role as opposed to a crew member is just because you don't know. You just don't know, and, and that's fine. I, I'm glad you're here, and, but if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you now know what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. We've made it crystal clear that we have this mandate from God, and our message is an important one. So our accept, expectation is all of us are going to be this generous people with our time and money. Now, now what we're insane about this. Uh, we believe it's what Scripture teaches, and we attach our generosity with time and money, to advancing the mission. Now, what Jesus gave his disciples right before he left made the mission crystal clear for everybody, not just churches, but for every individual that walks the planet. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. These were the parting words to the local church. John Wesley is talking to a bunch of young pastors one day, and he says, you just have one business in life to save souls. You have one goal, one. And for some of us, you just don't know that that's what this church is designed to do. The whole thing is working to accomplish that. Here's a second reason why some of you choosing to be a passenger is because you sort of got distracted along the way. See if this isn't true. Your sense of awe has become, ah, you got focused on a hang-up. 
you caused division or experienced division in the body. You didn't like a decision that was made. You have a personality conflict with someone. A minor has become a major in your life and in your home. We all know people who left the church. We all know people who left a body of believers because of a minor. Y'all remember hearing the stories about people that left the church because of the color carpet that was put in? You remember hearing things like that? That's sort of our reputation, isn't it? Because apparently all of us have some personality struggles, you know. Apparently we get grumpy quick. And a minor becomes a major. And I know that's true. Do you know how come I know that's true? Well, because I see it in my own life. Right? You think the pastor gets his way all the time around here? Mercy, 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 mercy. People in the church world aren't living generous lives with their time, and they're not communicating it as a value in their home, in part because they took their toys and went home. There's no room for petty when you're on a battleship. There's room for petty when you're on a cruise liner. Oh, I don't like the way y'all made this prime rib. Send it back to the kitchen. There's room. Come on, that's true, right? Nobody on a battleship says, I don't like the way this was prepared. Send it back. <laughs> Nobody. You know why? We got a mission to accomplish. We have something we're trying to accomplish together. The task and the purpose are so important that anything that detracts is way down on this list of priorities. And you are a vital part of the mission of the church. You are. Each of you as individuals are a vital part of the mission of this church. And just so you're clear, I'm not just talking to a mass of people. I'm talking to you personally. If we were having coffee together, I would say, you have a vital part to this church. And you would say, Tom, I don't have a role in the church. And I would say, that's simply not true. That may be a lie that you have taught yourself that you are now living under, but it's not anything close to what Scripture says because the Scripture says this is an all play. Ephesians 4, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Jesus Christ. And from him, the whole body, that's, that's the, the called out ones, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part, each person does his or her work. So, so, so you may not be involved. You may be kind of on a pastor thing because you don't know. That may be one. The second reason is because you kind of got distracted. Your awe became awe. But here's the third one. And I just want to clear it up today because we have a wrong idea of what it means to belong to a church. This is especially true, I think, in, in the South. I don't know. But a live Wesleyan church, we need all hands on deck to create environments where people respond to Jesus Christ. That's why we boldly ask you, your bank president, your lawyer, you work, you know, sweating all day long, and you come in the church is asking you to do something more. Yes. Why, why, could you do, why do you do that? Well, the entire alive experience is designed to help people respond to Jesus Christ. And we think that's worth your time. We think it's worth our time. And the, this whole thing is in hopes that people will embrace spiritual transformation. And we are at our peak when as a church we're marked by that kind of generosity. So you just think of the family that you know that's not walking with the Lord. You just think of the family that's going through the grind right now and having a difficult time. Do you think Jesus would be a difference maker in that home? That's why we're asking you to be a part. That's why I'm asking you to get out of the lounge chair and find a station. Because it's that important. Now just two observations when a church is marked by generosity. And the first has to do with this concept of what it means to be a member. There are dramatic differences between a member mentality and an owner mentality. American Express taught us that membership has its 
privileges. Oh, that's not true. At least not in church world. <laughs> when I was in seminary, I worked at a country club. I mowed grass. It's kind of the way that I helped with the income, and I was going through all the master's work and ran the weed eater, or it ran me, and we did the maintenance at the country club, all that kind of stuff. And, and if something was wrong, a member of the country club would come up to me on the tractor or whatever and say, Tom, there's a tree down in fairway number four. And you know what my response to that would be? Yes, sir, I'll take care of it right away. Or they'll come and say, Tom, the greens are hairy. They need to be cut. Yes, sir, I will call that in right now. Tom, that hole's cut too close to the edge of the green. No, it's well because your golf game stinks. <laughs> no, I, I didn't say that part, but it was what I thought, you know, <laughs> just, just trying to keep this whole thing real. But the expectation of the member was I would change what they asked me to change. Everybody with me? Now, imagine if I were to go home, say, after church today, and I was to call a meeting around the table and say to the family, I noticed there are leaves in the yard. One of y'all need to be on that. <laughs> I noticed the sink is leaking. Someone make sure they get on that. Well, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to be up there fixing the sink in a little bit. It's what's going to happen because members have rights. Owners have joyful responsibility. Members expect someone else to do it. Owners take responsibility to get it done. Members pay, owners possess. A battleship is filled with men and women who possess the mission they're on. And churches that are thriving have owners who embrace the mission and prioritize being a part of it. I remember we got a call a while back from someone in the church, and they said, hey, I've just met so-and-so, and they need groceries. Does the church do anything for this? Yes, we do. Take your arm and reach around there to the back side of which you have. And dig that <laughs> English people, just forgive me. And dig back there and pull ten dollars out of your wallet and give to the person who has food, needs food. We don't have a program or organization. We have the body of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. We're owners. We're, we're not just that here. For heaven's sakes, don't become a member of this church just to be that here. That's a complete waste of time. But if you want to be an owner, then that means the mission of this church has actually become part of the ethos of your life. And when you're driving through town, you don't just drive through town kind of haphazardly, but you start to see it through the lens of what it would mean if we were actually hope to the world. There's a difference when you're on a battleship. Churches are, th are thriving when they have owners who embrace the mission and are actually championing the mission and prioritizing being a part of it. Here's the last one. Churches, churches that are marked with generosity understand this. There's a purpose to your personal redemption. In other words, it's not just about your fire insurance. This isn't just about to make sure that when you die, you don't go to hell. But, but generous churches are marked with people who understand there's actually a purpose to why God redeemed us. And the church needs to be a place where you feel enabled to live out that redemption. When we first started this whole thing, we wrote down on a piece of paper what it would be like to create a church where people actually come alive. What it would be like to be part of a church where people come alive. And God is prepared to work for everybody on the planet. Ephesians 2. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so you can boast, for we are all God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ, why? To do good works, which God prepared, listen, in advance for us to do. Now, you all go home and interpret this for yourselves. But when I read that, what it means is, even before Tom walked the planet, God prepared some works for Tom to be a part of when he redeemed his soul. What if that's true for everybody in this room? Because when I read that verse, it doesn't say just for you pastors. It's for all of us. Everybody in the room. You have to find a place that this is going to settle down in your life. 
Now, I want to make this painfully simple, <laughs> and it's probably not a great illustration, but just allow me to kind of make this as painfully simple as I can. And imagine you did something horrible, and you were sentenced to die. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. So, let's say, let's say that it was by firing squad. You know, I just watched Three Musketeers. So, there's a three, there's a firing squad. So, they put the blindfold on you and line you up against a wall. Everybody with me? And in that, in that moment of silence, whatever goes through the mind of a person condemned to die, and you're standing there and you're just kind of waiting because, you know, what is it going to feel like? Am I going to feel anything? You know, all these things in your brain, you're kind of regretting or all these things. But in the moment when you're standing there and you're waiting to hear the gun kind of, the, the thingy pull back, you know, when you're getting ready to hear that, and there's a voice that says to your executioner, hold up. I don't know if that's what Jesus is saying, but hold up. I will stand in their stead. So you put the blindfold on me and allow me to take on his punishment and what he deserves. My life for his life. So this is you. You're standing there with the blindfold on. You're getting ready to take it, whatever's coming. And a voice says, hold up. I'll take his place. You don't even know the voice. I'll stand in his stead. And you're trying to do that thing around the blindfold where you're trying to move your eyes so you can see everything around a blindfold just to see who in the world that is. But the voice says, my life for his life. And the blindfold's removed and a man is actually put in your place. And in the moment, you lock eyes with the man and you struggle to find words of gratitude and understanding. But there are none. Because what the man has said he's going to do doesn't make any rational sense. And so all you say in the moment is, why are you doing this? Or maybe you'd be a little more like me. What can I do for you? You're getting ready to die for my crime. And the man says, just remember this. You just remember this moment. And you remember what I did for you. Now let me ask you this question. If that was your scenario, can you imagine never telling anyone Can you imagine living an entire life, 70 or 80 or 90 years, and never telling anybody? You all are well-churched, so you know where the preacher takes it from here. But that little scenario kind of brought back to me the price of the redemption of this pitiful, sin-diseased, unfaithful soul. And that what the Son of God had to pay was actually lifeblood for me to be free. And that's true for everybody in the room. And so, in my worldview, you wrestle with it for yourself. It is our moral and spiritual opportunity and obligation to spend our lives remembering what was done for us and to live crazy nuts generously out of gratitude for the day somebody took our place. So where do we go from here? Well, I think you should wrestle with this, to be honest with you. I want you to wrestle with it. I don't want you to do these things just because Tom said in this moment. I just want you to ask yourself, is this what you believe the Bible teaches? And if it is, then I want to encourage you to find a place of action. Um, a week from tomorrow, our church is doing an event called All Hands on Deck. It's a Monday night, and it's at 6.30. And if you want to get involved, if you, are all, if you are already involved, almost choked right there, I almost just choked myself, but if you are already involved, let's gather together 
And if you want to move from passenger to crew member, be at this event. Be at this event because I'm going to weed out in this moment all the people that are sort of just investigating. And for that evening, I get to speak directly to the crew. So don't come expecting like a Sunday morning, tell a joke, be entertained. If, you, if you're a crew member and you want to be part, come to that event. And it's designed to move all people, whether you're a current volunteer or crew member or you're just trying to find your place. It's designed to move us into generous living. And you say, Tom, why should, I, why should I do that on a Monday night of all things? Well, we have some great opportunities that are just now beginning to, to come forward at Alive Wesleyan. And in December... Uh, we are actually packing meals in our, one of our, after, during one of our Sunday morning at one of our church services for Stop Hunger Now. We'll be packing a minimum of 10,000 meals on a Sunday morning. And we need volunteers. We need generous givers. Because if you give more, we'll pack more. That's going to happen in December. On Christmas Eve, we're actually doing three services. Christmas Eve for me and my family. No, Christmas Eve was the day before Jesus was born. Now you meddling, Tom. I know, I know. In February, we're pulling off a prom for people with special needs. It's going to happen right here in this room. It's a community. It's in our people with special needs in our community. It's called A Night to Shine. It's with the Tim Tebow Foundation, and we've been given, we're one of 45 churches across the nation that were picked by the Tim Tebow Foundation to pull off a prom for people with special needs. And so we're going to do hairstyles and makeups and limo drives and whatever dances they do. I mean, all these kinds of things we're doing. But everybody there has to have a buddy. It's part of that event. We're doing that in February. It's at all hands on deck. In January, we're going to begin our fourth service. Many of you have heard about it. We need to increase generous ownership across the board. Listen, <laughs> Uh, I just heard this week that we, we need 50 new volunteers just for greeting and hospitality. Now you can imagine what children, and many of you have been responding over the last few weeks, but what the children's department is going to need, we need help. And there are a couple other things that I can't even tell you yet because it's a big secret that are going to happen. <laughs> and we're so excited about happening in, in 2016. But there is a reason that we must be marked by generosity. Do you remember what the results were of our spiritual parents? Not your mom and dad or grandma. I'm talking about all the way back to the first church. Do you remember what the results were when a group of people just like us, actually they had a lot less than we do, and they decided they were going to launch this thing called the church? Do you remember what the results were when they said, we don't have much, but what we have, we will give? Acts chapter 2, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So this is an invitation for you to become part of someone's faith journey someone's faith story, someone's salvation day. And if your sense of awe has sort of become awe, well, then I'd encourage you to kind of revisit the mission, to be generous people, live with reckless generosity. And who knows, maybe this church will continue to be literally someone's hope.